whenever you want. All right, thank you very much. Um, so for my second class, I'll focus on concepts and cosmology in group field theory. Uh, so I expect that many of you attended the first part, uh, but for those of you who didn't, I'll just briefly review what we saw there. So uh, in, the, in the first part of the class, I really focused on the connection between group field theory and spin foams and canonical loop quantum gravity. And in particular, we saw that if you take uh, group field theory, you look at its partition function, and then you do the standard Feynman expansion, uh, then you'll recover the transition amplitudes of a spin foam model. And you can choose your group field theory in such a way so that you recover uh, a specific spin foam model that you might be interested in for, say, quantum gravity. Uh, in this part of the class, I want to show a concrete example of how having uh, the field theory uh, framework allows us to do calculations that don't require a perturbative expansion based on foams. So, and, and not only is, is this um, a nice example of a calculation that uses the techniques that are become available when you have a group field theory, but also it's relevant when we want to describe quantum gravity effects in our early universe. So I already went through a few of these, the first few slides on Tuesday. So I'll go through them again uh, a little bit more quickly, just for those of you who weren't there. But as I think everyone knows, one of the best chances that we have to test quantum gravity is in the early universe. So the two places where we expect quantum gravity effects to be very important are near the center of a black hole and in the very early universe. But since a black hole, or at least the central region is hidden by a horizon, uh, it's not obvious how we could test that uh, observationally. But we do see the cosmic microwave background from the very early universe. And so it's possible that there could be some early quantum gravity effects that leave an imprint in the CMB that we could potentially see today. So I think that really is one of our best chances to test any theory of quantum gravity. And so this is something that uh, should be studied in some detail. Now, there's been a lot of work in loop quantum cosmology looking at quantum gravity effects in the early universe. But this is really based on imposing homogeneity and isotropy first on the classical theory, and then quantizing this simpler model. And this is, has been very productive, and I've worked on it a lot myself, as well as many others. Um, but clearly, it would be even better if we could start from full quantum gravity, and then reduce down to its cosmological sector. So quantize full gravity, uh, without imposing symmetries first, and then see what we get and see if we get the same thing or not. Okay, now coming from the perspective of group field theory and loop quantum gravity, um, we have these predictions that geometry is quantized, and we have all these quantum geometry that you can glue together to create a space time. And so coming from this perspective, it's reasonable to expect that our universe is made of an enormous number of quantum geometry uh, rather than just, say, one or two very big quanta. So what I'll do is I'll look at GFT states that are highly excited. And by this, I mean states that have many quanta of geometry, or in the QFT language, many particle states. And I'll focus on condensate states for reasons that I'll come back to later. And because we're interested in the dynamics of the universe as a whole um, in its entirety, uh, we'll be interested in the collective behavior of these states. So we're interested in the emergent dynamics that arise from the collective observables of these GFT states. And this is a little bit like hydrodynamics. So if we're interested in how a river is flowing, we don't necessarily zoom in on a specific water molecule and ask what is you know, the state of this particular water molecule. But we're interested in the collective dynamics of all the molecules moving together. Um, and so, from this perspective, we're really looking at cosmology as a sort of hydrodynamics. We're interested in the collective behavior of many quantum geometry uh, interacting together rather than on one specific excitation. OK, so today, um, the, this talk will be split into three parts. So first, I'll go over group field theory with a scalar field. I already said a little bit about this on Tuesday. So again, I'll be quite fast here. The point is, because we're interested in cosmology, we have to include some matter field. 
So just from classical general relativity, we know that if you're interested in a homogeneous and isotropic space-time, you need to have some matter field to have non-trivial dynamics. So if it's a vacuum, you just get Minkowski space and that won't describe our universe. You have to include some matter field. So there's some evolution so the universe expands or contracts. Uh, then I'll say a little bit more about condensate states. First, why we're interested in them. And then second, look at some of their properties. And then finally, I'll show you how we can extract emergent cosmological dynamics from these condensate states. Okay. So as we saw on Tuesday, we have a group field theory for four dimensional quantum gravity. And this is essentially a scalar field with four group elements, four SU2 group elements. Now, if we wanna add a matter field, then we add an extra argument to our GFT field phi. And so this is this chi term here, which corresponds to a scalar field. Now, there are many types of matter that are interesting. Here, just to keep things as simple as possible, we'll look at a massive scalar field. This is pretty much the simplest case that we can do, but of course, later on, we'll wanna go on and do more. But for now, I'm just gonna focus on this simple case. And if we work in the canonical version of group field theory, we have these field operators corresponding to the field uh, phi and its complex conjugate or its uh, adjoint. And here we just have those operators. And again, we just add an argument corresponding to the scalar field. So here I'm working in a specific representation just for convenience. So of course, there are different representations you can use in group field theory, just as in standard quantum field theory. And using the uh, J, M, and IOTA labels is convenient for what we want to do. So that's the representation I'll use. But of course, you could do something else if you liked. It's just that this happens to be convenient for our calculations. OK. Now, we also saw the action for a group field theory on Tuesday. So this is very similar uh, when we add a scalar field. You essentially add a kinetic term, which now depends on the value of the scalar field here. And the potential term itself does not. Um, here, I've suppressed all of the SU2 quantum numbers just so we focus on what happens with the scalar field. But as far as the SU2 quantum numbers go, it's exactly the same form as what you'd have in vacuum and what we saw on Tuesday. Okay, and this choice for S and, the and how it, the, the dependence on the scalar field shows up comes from the fact that when we're looking at our spin foam model, we're discretizing a scalar field on the vertices in the spin foam model. So if you have an interaction, you have a vertex, you have these edges that arrive at the vertex, then they all have the same value of the scalar field because the scalar field has a value, fixed value chi at the vertex. On the other hand, if you look at the propagator, you have an edge that goes from one vertex to another. So you'll have some chi one here, some chi two here. And so the propagator has, will go from one value of chi one to another value chi two. And that's why we have this form here for the propagator. And finally, because this is a massive scalar field, um, the propagator will only depend on the difference between the values of chi one and chi two, right? So uh, if you look at the action of a massive scalar field, it only depends on how the scalar field changes. And so that's captured in the uh, dependence of K on chi one and chi two. Okay, so this is, um, what we had discussed uh, on Tuesday. So I've gone through a little bit more quickly, uh, but if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. So now what we've done is that we're interested in looking at group field theory with a scalar field. So we can talk about cosmology. And the, one of the important roles that the scalar field will play is that we can use it as a clock. So remember that in group field theory, we have the problem of time. We need to, if we want to compare how a state evolves in time, so we can compare, let's say, to how our universe is expanding in time, we have to somehow resolve the problem of time. And one way we can do that is by using the scalar field to define relational operators. So 
in, in direct analogy to standard QFT, you have a number operator, you have exactly the same thing in group field theory. And so the first expression here is just the standard number operator. So you have phi dagger phi, then you sum over all quantum numbers and that'll give you a total number operator. But what's gonna be very important for us when we wanna look at cosmology is a relational number operator. And so we can define a number operator at some instant of time. And by instant of time, I mean relational time using the scalar field chi as a clock. So instead of integrating over all possible values of chi, you fix chi to some value, chi naught, and then you calculate the number operator at that instant of scalar field time, chi naught. And so this gives a relational number operator. And for example, it's possible to see how this number operator changes as you change the value of chi naught. Okay, um, just a quick comment here. You have to be a little bit careful because chi is, has a continuous uh, spectrum. And so this operator will be distributional. So this is just something you need to be aware of and you have to be a little bit careful when you define this to regulate this expression appropriately. Um, I don't wanna go into the details here, uh, but the point is uh, you can define this number operator, which tells you how many quanta you have in your state at some value, chi naught. And as chi naught changes, we can see how the state evolves with respect to this scalar field. And so this will become our time variable. Okay, an operator that will be very important in the context of cosmology is the relational total volume operator. So, if we just think about classical general relativity, the geometry of a homogeneous and isotropic spacetime is entirely captured by its scale factor and its Hubble rate. And I can easily define a volume just by cubing the scale factor. And the Hubble rate, which is just the time derivative of the scale factor divided by the scale factor, I can also express in terms of the volume. And I just get an extra factor of three because uh, the volume is the scale factor cubed. So the derivative will bring down a factor of three, so I just need to cancel that out. So if I know the volume at some instant and also its rate of change, then of, I know everything about homogeneous and isotropic space-time. So in group field theory, I, I, we need a, a relational volume operator to make contact with cosmology, and that has the following form. So we just have, uh, this is very analogous to the energy operator in QFT, where you have the uh, A dagger A weighted by the energy for any given mode. So here we have the phi dagger phi, and we're summing over all quantum numbers, and it's weighted by the volume for each quanta. So, what this operator does is, is that it counts how many quanta you have with a certain volume, then it takes that number, multiplies it by the volume of that particular quanta, and then sums over all different types of quanta. So at the end, you have the total volume of your state. Uh, just a quick comment here, I've changed the basis that I'm using slightly uh, to describe the group field theory uh, field operators. So before we had operators corresponding to J, M, and iota for the intertwiner. Now I'm using J, M, and nu, and nu is the eigenvalue of the volume operator for a given spin network node. So if you know the intertwiner, then you can expand that in a basis of the uh, eigenstates of the volume operator and vice versa. So you can switch back and forth uh, between these two bases. And so of course, this basis using nu is much more convenient when you want to calculate the volume. Okay, uh, the key point here is just that now we have a volume operator, which depends on chi, so it depends on our internal clock variable. And, we, and by knowing how V evolves, we can make contact with cosmology. Okay, 
So th this was just a general statement of how can we contact with cosmology, but we'd also like to know, well, what state should we consider? So of course, in group field theory, there are all kinds of states that we can construct, and we'd like to be able to pick a state which we think is relevant for cosmology. And for that, we don't wanna just do this blindly. We want to use whatever insight we have from earlier work in quantum cosmology. And at least coming from the perspective of loop quantum gravity and group field theory, uh, this means asking what we've learned about the early universe from loop quantum cosmology. So let me just point out a few things from loop quantum cosmology. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The first thing is that the field strength operator that you need to construct your Hamiltonian constraint operator in loop quantum cosmology is obtained by taking the huonomy of the ash harbor connection around a loop of minimal area, which is given by the area gap or of the order of the Planck area. And of course, this area is measured by the space-time metric. So you're, you're, you're taking the huonomy of the connection around a loop of minimal physical area. And from that, you construct the field strength operator. Now, implicitly, this is motivated by the idea that if we have space-time, say a cosmological space-time in this case, it's composed of many minimal excitations of geometry. So if I'm interested in this spatial region here, I expect that it's composed of a huge number of Planck-sized quanta of geometry, rather than just one quantum that has a very, very large quantum number. And this really goes into the fact that we're, when we define the field strength operator, we take the loop around, uh, around a region that has a minimal area, right? So if we thought that space-time is composed of uh, quanta of geometry with larger areas, then we'd go around a larger, a loop with a larger area. So by making this choice for the field strength operator, we're really, making the assumption that our space-time is composed of many, many quantum geometry that each have a small physical volume and surface area. And of course, small volume and small surface area corresponds to a small J. Okay, then you can look at the quantum dynamics that you derive in loop quantum cosmology, and you see that you get a difference operator which relates states with spatial volumes that differ by the Planck volume, essentially. And here also the dynamics is given in relational terms. So you're really calculating how the state evolves with respect to a scalar field. So in this case, it's very analogous to what we're doing in group field theory here. Uh, an important result, from quantum cosmology is that the Big Bang singularity is replaced by a non-singular bounce. So the singularity that appears in classical general relativity is resolved and you have a non-singular bounce instead. And finally, for sharply peaked states, the quantum dynamics can be approximated to, and this approximation is, is excellent, uh, by an effective Friedman equation that has the following form. So your Hubble rate squared is equal to uh, the energy density, epsilon here. So this, this is the, so this first part is just the classical Friedman equation. Then you have this extra correction here, which includes the quantum gravity effects. And you have this correction here that becomes important when the energy density approaches this critical energy density, which is of the order of the Planck energy density. And that's when the bounce happens. Okay. Um, so this is what we get from quantum cosmology. Now, what does that, what can we take from that to construct the state that we're interested in for group field theory? So the first thing is that the GFT states that we're most interested in uh, are states that have many quantum geometry with small j. Second, the dynamics will be driven by a change uh, in the volume. So of course, the universe is expanding or contracting, so the volume is changing, but this will be dominated by the effect of adding or removing quantum geometry and not changing quantum numbers. So of course, in principle, both are possible, but what loop quantum cosmology is telling us is that it seems that the dominant effect is that 
the volume of the universe changes by either adding or removing quanta geometry rather than changing the quantum numbers of the quanta that are already present. And finally, it would be nice if we could make contact with loop quantum cosmology. So is there a bounce? And is there a similar or perhaps even identical effective Friedman equation that we can find? Okay, so this of course is just based on hints from loop quantum cosmology. Uh, so we could explore other possibilities also, but I think this gives us a very nice starting point uh, to look at states that we're interested in. Okay, I think someone raised their hand. Um, let me... Oh yeah, okay. Honk, you can uh, unmute yourself now and ask your question. Yep. Um, so just in the slide previously, um, you defined the volume operator, um, which is local in the clock variable. I'm not very familiar with um, the, the clocks, essentially. Um, so is there a physical argument for why can't the um, volume operator depend on, for example, clocks um, in different um, areas of, uh, in different quanta of uh, geometry, essentially? Right, so, so this, uh, you're right, I, I didn't mention this. This is really input from, from loop quantum gravity. So from, so, and, and the idea behind this is, is that the, these quantum geometry really represent spin network nodes. So if, let's say you're working in canonical loop quantum gravity, you would have a spin network, and then you have some operators corresponding to say area or volume and so on. And in loop quantum gravity, it turns out that the volume operator acts on the nodes of the spin network, and it only depends on the uh, on the geometric quantum numbers, so on on the J and the iota quantum numbers. And then here I'm just doing a change of basis to to switch out iota for for new, um, but uh, but but essentially this is a result from loop quantum gravity that we're importing into group field theory. Right, so that's the new, um, which is the uh, eigenvalue, which I understand that you're mm -hmm. doing a change of basis and, you know, from intertwiners to this eigenvalue basis. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just that, like, what's the, what's the clock, basically? Right, so, so the clock is a matter field. Right. So this is just a massless scalar field. Mm -hmm. And classically, we know that a massive scalar field will just evolve monotonically, so it acts as a good clock. And so here, we're, we're asking, okay, well, can we define the operators and construct them in such a way so that we can then use the scalar field as a clock, just like we can in the classical theory. And, and so this is what I'm doing here. And one of the, the key points is that in let's say canonical loop quantum gravity, if we talk about a volume operator, it doesn't depend at all on the matter of fields that are there. Mm -hmm. It only depends on the geometric mm -hmm. uh, data. I think I see what you're saying. So it's a, it's a functional equation and you're thinking about one configuration of the clock? Uh, right, so, so we're, just, we're fixing the clock to have a certain value. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and then we're saying, okay, for that specific value, then uh, what does this operator give? I see, I see. So it's a classical sort of... Well, like we're, we're using insight from the classical theory to, to help us decide what operators may be appropriate to construct in the quantum theory. Okay, so in principle, the clock could fluctuate and the... Um... Mm -hmm. You, you get like additional terms that would uh, contribute to this operator that would depend non- Right, so, so here you, you could also yeah. consider other types of operators with some different dependence on, on the clock variable. But for, for the purposes of cosmology, those seem to be less relevant. So of course, you, know, you have a lot of freedom in the operators that you can construct. Uh, the question is, which ones do you do you select because you think you can then make contact with uh, the physics that you're interested in? Thanks. Okay, so let me.
go on here. So we have some input from loop quantum cosmology. And so the question now is, how should we choose our GFT states? And, uh, and then we can, of course, study those states and try to extract, extract physics from them. So what GFT state do we think corresponds to a cosmological space time? Now, a very natural choice are condensed states. So these are many particle states. So as I just argued, we want some state which is highly excited with respect to the Fock vacuum. Um, and these states are, have many, many quanta of geometry, but for condensed states, all of these quanta are in exactly the same state. So th in this sense, a condensed state is homogeneous at the quantum level because the space-time is just composed of all of these quantum geometry that are identical. So in a sense, this is a very strong version of homogeneity. And so in this sense, it seems like a very natural state to look at to try to extract cosmology from it. Okay, um, here we'll consider a relatively simple form of condensate states. And so this is just, you take the exponential of the creation operator and act on the Fock vacuum. And there's some weighting here of the creation operator within the exponential. And this is sigma, which is known as the condensate wave function. So you just exponentiate the creation operator weighted by some condensate wave function, and that's your condensate state. Uh, here I've dropped an overall normalization because of course you want the state to be normalized, but that's just a numerical prefactor, which isn't important for what we'll discuss later. Okay. Now, a very nice property that this state has is that it's an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. So if I act on it with the annihilation operator, I just get, get back the exact same state multiplied by the constant wave function. So that's a very nice property. Now, of course, this is a very simple state. So we can't expect this to be an exact solution to the GFT quantum dynamics. At best, this will be an approximate solution. And one thing that I want you to think about here is that this, uh, Condensate state is constituted of many quantum geometry, but they're all disconnected. So if you remember on Tuesday, I explained how by entangling different quantum geometry, you could connect them. Here, this hasn't been done. So you just have a state with many, many quantum geometry, but they're all disconnected. Now, of course, we, we would really like to include connectivity, but then the calculations become much, much more challenging. And we haven't been able to, to do this in any detail yet. So this is an outstanding goal for, for this approach to cosmology. Okay, now we could consider any type of condensate state, of course, but we'll look at the isotropic uh, condensate state. So that means that we're taking the condensate wave function to be isotropic in the following sense. So we assume that all of the J labels are the same. So remember that when your, your condensate wave function carries four J labels, J1, J2, J3, J4, corresponding to the four J labels on a tetrahedron. Here we're gonna require that they're all identical. And we'll also require that the volume be the maximum volume possible uh, for these given four J. So of course, you, you, if let's say you have J is equal to 10, you'll have a number of volume uh, eigenvalues. And if you pick the, the largest volume eigenvalue, this would correspond to the most isotropic possible uh, tetrahedron within the quantum framework. Okay, so this fixes J and nu. And then finally, we pick M just by imposing gauge invariance in these indices. This doesn't affect the dynamics at all. So I'll skip over that very quickly. The point is that we end up with a constant wave function, which is only labeled by one J. So for each value of j, then you know exactly uh, what the entire constant wave function is. Okay. Now, of course, we don't just choose this freely. It has to be a solution, or at least an approximate solution to the quantum dynamics. So if we had a true solution, it would satisfy these quantum equation of motions. But as I already said, this won't be an exact solution, but an approximate solution. So we're just gonna require the simpler case that the expectation value of the equations of motion be satisfied. And I won't take you through the calculations. They're not very illuminating, but you get this condition on the constant wave function. So you start off with this state, 
course, which is entirely determined by the constant wave function. So at the end, you end up with just an equation of motion for your constant wave function. Okay, um, I am. I have 20 minutes left or so before we stop for questions. So I'll go through this a little bit quickly, but for those of you who are interested in the details, uh, they'll be posted on the website later and you can take a look at the slides in more carefully. So first of all, the condensate that we're looking at, this is a good state for a Bose-Einstein condensate. And these types of condensates have very weak interactions. And in this case, it's a good approximation. So, but if the interactions become large, then this constant state is no longer uh, a good approximation to the, uh, to the quantum equations of motion. So we can only use this constant if interactions are subdominant. So we're just gonna drop the potential term. Afterwards, we could come back and check to see whether this was uh, a reasonable thing to do or not. Uh, second, we can expand the kinetic term uh, in a derivative expansion. And what this means is that we get uh, a term which has no derivatives and then a term which has a quadratic derivative. And then higher order terms also, which we neglect. Okay, and then we can rewrite the equation in this form. And essentially depending on the GFT action that will tell us what this MJ term is here. And depending on that, we can find the solution for the constant wave function that we're looking for. Okay, so the, the key thing to, to remember from here is that our constant wave function must satisfy this equation. And this mj squared term just comes from the parameters in the GFT action. So once you tell me what your GFT action, that tells you what mj is. Okay, the wave function is complex, so we can split it into its modulus and phase. And we get an equation of motion for each, which I show here. Um, the second equation, this one here can be solved directly. And so you can integrate that and you find that uh, your theta prime has this relationship here where QJ is just a constant of integration. Then we substitute that in to the first equation right here. And then we recover this equation of motion. And this is very similar to a standard uh, problem in mechanics, and you can easily convince yourself that there is a conserved quantity, which would be, quote unquote, the energy in a mechanical system. Uh, but the main point is that you have a conserved quantity uh, relating uh, for this equation of motion. So we've solved the second equation. We're only left with the first equation, which would be written in this way, and there's this conserved quantity. Okay, so this is relatively easy to solve. So that's nice. And we'd like to compare with cosmology. So as I mentioned, we'd like to look at the uh, relational volume. And this is just given by this volume operator. And for a constant wave function, it has this very simple form. It's just uh, nu times uh, rho squared and summing over j. And because we're looking at these isotropic constant states, Nu has this very simple dependence on J. So if I look at the Hubble rate, I get this very simple relation. And of course, I'll use this to make contact with cosmology in just a second. We also want to talk about a scalar field. So in full group field theory, we have this operator that corresponds to the momentum of the scalar field. And I can apply this on the condensate state and I get this expectation value. And what's important is that this is a sum of constants. So remember that these Qs are all constants of integration. So this is just a number. It doesn't depend on the relational clock chi at all. Okay. Now we have, sorry, if I go back here, we have this relationship for the Hubble rate and I can substitute for this rho j prime here. And that gives this equation. And let me start by looking at the classical limit. So the classical limit is obtained in the limit when the volume is large. So when the volume is large, that means that 
uh, the row, row J's are all large. And then the Hubble rate simplifies to this form. And also like, and again, to make contact with general relativity to see if I have a good classical limit, I wanna talk about the energy density of the scalar field, and it has this form. Okay, so I'm going through this quite quickly, but the, the key point is that this is really building on what we did earlier, right? So we introduced the, this volume operator, we explained how to calculate the Hubble rate, and now I'm just doing it for this specific state. The calculations are quite straightforward, so those of you who are interested, you can just go back over the slides and fill in the steps. Okay, now I have these results. I want to make contact with general relativity and at least see if I have a good classical limit. Now, I had these Friedman equations in general relativity, but those are, of course, expressed in terms of some coordinate time. And I don't have a coordinate time in group field theory. So I need to rewrite the equations, the Friedman equations of general relativity using my scalar field as a clock. So you can quickly check that the evolution of chi is linear. And so, or it's monotonic, sorry. And so what that means is that you can change between chi and t as your time variable. And so, and this is essentially just the chain rule. And one of the results that you get is that the momentum, of the scalar field is constant. And so we already saw that we obtained that result earlier. So it's nice that we already have made contact there. Okay, the classical Freeman equation has this form. And if I want to express the Friedman, or sorry, the Hubble rate in terms of my relational clock chi, I just need to do a change of, of variables and use the chain rule. So if I want to go from something where I have a time derivative to something where I have a chi derivative, I just get this extra factor here. So this is what I'm doing in this step here. And then you can quickly check that the end result is that the Hubble rate expressed in this relational form where I'm using chi as a clock is just equal to a constant. That's the classical result. So this is what I'd like to get in, uh, in the classical limit for my GFT condensate state. Okay, so to have a nice classical limit, we need pi chi to be constant. And we also need this relation for the Hubble rate expressed in terms of the relational scalar field. So the first condition is satisfied. We, we already saw that the expectation value of pi chi is just a constant, so that's good. And then if I look at the large volume limit of the GFT Friedman equation, which we saw a few slides back. So here I have really just copied this equation here. And we see that if this mj here is just a constant, and I can take it outside of the sum, then this, these sums here over j in the numerator and the denominator will just cancel out. And then I will exactly match the classical result if mj squared has this particular value. So what this means is that I get a good classical limit for this state for this choice for the coupling constants that show up in my GFT action. Um, I'll just mention that we don't need, uh, it's not necessary that all MJ satisfy this relationship. This, this condition is sufficient, but it's not necessary. So you could have, for example, a case where these sums are just dominated by a few terms. Perhaps those are the terms that contribute the most. And in that case, you just need that for those few terms that this condition holds. And then you'll have a good classical limit. Okay, so let me recap what we've done so far. Uh, we constructed a condensate state in group field theory. Uh, we saw how to extract a relational volume observable. And from that, uh, construct the, an operator corresponding to the Hubble rate. So we have some equation for the Hubble rate expressed in relational terms. We also have some uh, expression for the momentum of the scalar field and the energy density expressed in the same relational way. And then 
we want to compare that with classical cosmology. And we can do that by looking at the large volume limit. And we get the correct classical limit for a certain choice of parameters in the GFT action. So we can make some choices in the GFT action. And then these constant states will give exactly the same behavior, at least in the classical limit, as what you would expect from general relativity. So this is uh, this shows that the connection is, is uh, quite good. OK. Now, here so far, talk about the classical limit. What about the quantum region, where we have large quantum gravity effects? So just from the definition of the volume operator, we can see that if this rho term remains non-zero, then the volume never vanishes. And if the volume never goes to zero, then there's no Big Bang singularity. OK. So let's look at the equation of motion for rho. It has this form. This was given on a previous slide, so I just copied it over again. And this you can recognize as being a particle in a central potential. And this central potential is repulsive due to these minus signs that you see there. And so what you can see is that so long as qj is non-zero, then the, the rho terms will always remain positive. And there will be no Big Bang singularity simply because the volume never becomes zero. Um, let me just mention that the momentum of the scalar field is given by this sum over QJ. So if, if you want a space time which is not vacuum, that means that your pi chi has to be non zero. And that means that at least one QJ has to be non zero. So generically, uh, rho J, at least for one J, will remain non-zero. So that means there's no Big Bang singularity uh, for this state. And a short calculation, I'll just refer you to, to the paper, uh, shows that the rho j decreases, reaches a minimum, and then increases. There's a single turning point. And actually, you can see it quite simply uh, from, from the form of this equation of motion. And since this is true for all j, the total volume will bounce. And so what we have is a non-singular bounce rather than a Big Bang singularity. And this is quite similar to what we had in loop quantum cosmology. So it's worth asking whether there's a connection that we can make there. OK, so we have our GFT condensate states. Uh, we've been able to extract uh, collective dynamics. So we're asking, how does the total volume change? At what rate? Uh, it has a nice classical limit for certain choices of the parameters in uh, the GFT action. And we have a non-singular bounce in the, in the quantum limit. So when quantum gravity effects become important. So let's see if we can make an even closer contact to quantum cosmology. And here, let's consider a condensate state where only one value of j dominates. And I'll call this j, j0. Um, so remember that in loop quantum cosmology, the idea when you, when you construct your, your field strength operator, which you use to eventually define your Hamiltonian constraint operator, is that you're taking the holonomy around these loops of minimal physical area. So essentially, you're assuming that this is the main contribution to the space time. So you have a huge number of quantum geometry that are all in this minimal uh, volume or minimal surface area state. So this is what we'll consider here. And let me just mention that this, you can actually show that this happens dynamically for a certain class of GFT actions. So for a certain class of GFT actions, this just comes out naturally in the classical limit. But here I'm just going to put it in by hand, just so I can try and make contact with loop quantum cosmology. And then my relational uh, Hubble rate simplifies considerably. So I get this, this term here. This looks a lot like quantum cosmology, as we'll see in a little bit more detail. Uh, and I get this extra term here. Um, the numerators are two constants. This is just the volume for this choice of j0. And this is uh, a constant of the motion, which uh, was sort of the quote unquote energy um, associated to, to that, to a mechanical system with the same equation of motion. Uh, so th this is just a constant divided by V, and then you have uh, this term here. Now, the first term is very similar to what you get in loop quantum cosmology. So if you, so again, the equation 
of motion that you have, the Friedman equation that you have in loop quantum cosmology is usually given with respect to a coordinate time. And so if you do a change of variables to express it in terms of the relational uh, scalar field that you're using as a clock, then the LQC effector Freeman equation has this form. And this up to uh, an identification between the epsilon M and epsilon C terms, these match exactly, assuming you choose uh, the correct value for MJ in the GFT action. And if you set this energy constant to zero, which you can choose, this is just an initial condition essentially. Um, and these, these terms, epsilon M and epsilon C are indeed very, very similar. Uh, they're both at the Planck scale and up to factors of order one, they agree, uh, depending on what you make, what choice for J that you make um, for epsilon M. Okay, so what's nice is that now we, we have these general results for general constant states, but if we pick a specific type of constant state where only one value of these isotropic configurations dominates, then we would get something which is extremely similar to what you get in loop quantum cosmology. So not only do we have a nice classical limit and we have a resolution of the singularity which happens for any constant state, but if we choose a constant state motivated by loop quantum cosmology, we have a very close connection there. Okay, um, in the few minutes that I have left, I just wanna talk about some of the approximations that we made here. Um, so if you remember earlier, we neglected the effect of the interaction term. So we can go back and check to say, okay, was this a good approximation that we made or not? Now, you, you do the calculation and it turns out that the range of validity depends on the potential in the GFT action. Okay. So if you remember from, uh, what I presented on Tuesday, you have this lambda prefactor in front of the potential term that determines how strong or weak the interactions are. And so if the, this constant lambda is small, then the range of validity of this approximation will be big. But if lambda is very large, then of course, the range of validity of this, of this approximation is small. And of course, this makes sense because you're neglecting interactions and lambda tells you how important these interactions are or are not. Now, in any case, for sufficiently large volumes, the approximation will fail. Now, sufficiently large will depend on lambda. So if, if lambda is very, very small, then these volumes would have to be very, very large, uh, and so on. Okay. Ed, sorry, there is a yes. question? Yeah. So the question is, how much these results depend on the choice of the vertex amplitude? Um, so that will depend in, in large part, again, you, you can think of changing the vertex amplitude as just changing the potential entirely. Um, so if you change the potential, then the, the statement here will still be true, but the details behind sufficiently large will change. So again, if, if you have a different potential and you're saying, okay, I'm looking at this constant state, so I'm interested, I mean, this is only a good approximation in, in the limit where the interaction is small, then uh, depending on the details of the interaction, that will tell you what volumes are allowed or not. Typically, when the volumes are sufficiently small, this is a good interaction. When the volumes are sufficiently large, it's a poor interaction, sorry, a poor approximation. Um, but what sufficiently small and sufficiently large mean will depend on the specific interaction that you choose. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, the reason why we have this issue, I think, is that remember that we neglected connectivity entirely. And this was just to make the calculation simpler. If you start entangling all of these quanta geometry in order to connect them in a certain way, that makes the calculation much, much, much more complicated. But a drawback of this is that because there's no connectivity, the interactions are not restricted to nearest neighbors. So normally, if, if you have a spin network, you would expect that neighboring nodes only interact you know, with their nearest neighbors, essentially. But here, because you haven't told these nodes which other nodes they're coupled to, what, who their nearest neighbors are, essentially all of the other quanta are their nearest neighbors. So this is why the interactions grow very, very rapidly when you have a large number of quanta of geometry. And so if you want to really handle the large volume limit, 
it seems likely that we'll have to include connectivity information. So this is, uh, again, an outstanding problem, which is, is important to address. Still, uh, the results that we have do hold in a mesoscopic regime, so sort of intermediate regime. So we need the row to be sufficiently large so that the hydrodynamic approximation is reasonable, and we need them to be sufficiently small so that neglect interactions is possible. So within this regime, then the results that I presented, they hold. Okay, I'm almost out of time. So just very quickly, let me mention the possibility that there could be a scenario of geometrogenesis here. So what we've seen is that we get a bounce, and this matches loop quantum cosmology very nicely. But this result really depends on these interactions. So not only the choice of the condensate state that neglects interactions, but also look, working in the hydrodynamic approximation and so on. Now, if the hydrodynamic approximation breaks down in the early universe, so if rho is too small to really be able to describe it in some hydrodynamic way, then it probably doesn't make sense to think of a continuum geometry. So in this case, we would have something that's like geometrogenesis. So the emergence of a, of a continuum geometry. So you start off with some state which is not geometric, or at least not at the continuum level, and evolves into a state that looks like a space-time. So an important question is, you know, does this hydrodynamic approximation hold in the early universe? And this depends on the states that you look at. So for some choices, the answer is yes. For some, the answer is no. Uh, and here there's a question of what is the appropriate choice to make? And this is an open question right now. Uh, so I want to just finish by saying that if the approximations mentioned above do hold, then we can conclude that we do have a non-singular bounce. But if they don't, and if in particular the hydrodynamic approximation fails in the early universe, then perhaps we have a geometrogenesis scenario. Okay, um, I'm almost out of time. So let me just quickly review. We have these condensate states in group field theory, and these are homogeneous at the quantum level. So we can expect that this is a natural candidate for cosmology. Um, the results that we have hold in the mesoscopic regime, as I just explained. Within this regime, the collective dynamics of this condensate give an emergent Freeman equation that has the correct classical limit and that generically resolves the Big Bang singularity and replaces it by non-singular bounds. And if we consider the case where the constant is dominated by quantum one configuration, motivated by loop quantum cosmology, then we get dynamics that match very closely what we find in loop quantum cosmology. Um, I'll just flash this slide very quickly. There's been a lot of further work beyond what I discussed here. So I'll refer you to the literature for those of you who are interested. Um, and here on this slide, I just highlight some of what I think uh, from, my, from my own personal perspective are some of the most important questions. So first, we need to go beyond the mesoscopic regime and include connectivity somehow. So there has been some work in this direction, but there's still a lot to be done. I uh, would also like to make contact with observations. And so to do that, I'd like to develop cosmological perturbation theory. Um, I have some references on an earlier slide of some work in that direction. And there's also been some work on black holes. And so I'll refer you to this paper for that. So let me stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention and take any questions you may have. Thanks a lot, Ted. So yeah, please feel free to uh, post your question in the chat or raise your hand and I can unmute you for questions to head. Okay, so let me... So yes, you, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. So I had a question. Uh, so uh, how do we uh, construct of these condensate states or how do we build them? Is it, uh, uh, you know uh, that you've been telling us that like the, it's uh, very natural because uh, these are homogeneous and, uh, but how do we mathematically build them? Right, so uh, here we're looking at a specific type of, uh, of constant state. Uh, this is essentially uh, in, in condensed matter, this is known as the gross kutevsky constant state and it has this form. So this is just the 
you, you take the exponential of the creation operator. So here, right, you start off with your, your Fock vacuum. You act on it with the creation operator here, which has been exponentiated. And then you sum over all quantum numbers like this, and you have some weighting. So th th this is really just some function that, that weights the creation operator. And so this is the Conus state that we look at here. I have one more question. If you have time. Sure. So uh, uh, on the way, uh, you have chosen different m values and restricted some j values. Mm -hmm. So if do these all reconcile? I mean, if we want what we want in the end, are these values do they reconcile? I mean, because you have made different choices at different uh, instances. So. Um, yeah. Right, so so all the choices that I made have been consistent. There, there haven't been any contradictory choices at any point. Um, essentially, the, beyond this choice of the state, the, the two main things that I've done uh, is, actually, the, the main thing that I've done is just to neglect the interactions. That, that is the biggest thing. And that really has to do with the with checking the amplitude of the interaction term. And so, as I mentioned at the end, this is a good approximation within some regime. As far as M goes, this is just parameterizing terms in the GFT action. And these are terms that show up in the kinetic part of the GFT action. Uh, so this is completely independent of what we have uh, in terms of the interaction. So here, if you take the kinetic term and you just do a derivative expansion, which is what I do here, and I just keep the first two terms, um, then uh, what turns out to be relevant for the dynamics is this ratio. And so I just call this ratio MJ. And what, what, what and sorry, requiring the classical limit at the end of the calculation then imposes a specific form uh, for MJ, that MJ has a certain value. Okay, thanks, Head. So since we're out of time, I, I, I still want to ask you the question that has been posted in the chat and then we, sure. we may have to conclude. So sure. the question was, for the physical clock, do you apply the deparametrization scheme in classical gravity? Or is there any other scheme to construct the relational operators? Right, so there is a deparametrization scheme um, so I, I mentioned this on Tuesday. Uh, so if you look at my slides there, there's a reference to that possibility. Here, this is not what we do. Here, rather, we, we construct some operator. So um, let me see if I can just find that quickly. Right, so we, we construct an operator of this form where we evaluate the operator at that instant. As I mentioned, this operator is distributional and you have to regulate it in some way. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful about it in this framework. If you work from a deparametrized point of view, then you'll get something which is quite similar, but you don't have to worry about regulating it because then you have these equal time commutation relations. So the, the framework is a little bit different in that case. The results are quite similar. Um, so you can really think of this as a quantization ambiguity, uh, but they are slightly different. Uh, I realize I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll stop here. But if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll be happy to answer. Thanks a lot, Ed. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.